The New York Giants have a new defensive coordinator. Their weeks-long, seemingly interminable search ended on Monday when the Giants apparently hired Shane Bowen, former defensive coordinator of the the Tennessee Titans. And uh, folks, I don't know if we're calling this the Valentine's Views podcast, the Ed, the the Ed and Nick podcast, but whatever it is, I borrowed Nick Filato, Big Blue View contributor, and and uh great analyst that uh that works for us and, and a bunch of other places to uh, to talk about Bowen so uh, Nick thank you uh thank you for hopping on so that people don't have to just uh listen to my spiel for a while yeah yeah thank you so much for having me it's about time the giants hired somebody i'm sure there are many reasons why they did not make this hire you know, maybe a week or two ago, which we might be able to dive into a little bit. I'm sure some of the audience can infer what I'm insinuating. Well, sh- sure. Just give me, you know, let's let's talk about Shane Bowen specifically first before you, uh, you know, before we get into all of the other sort of ramifications. Just your uh, your initial thought of. Uh, of Bowen's defense. I know you had said off the air before we started that you studied him a little bit, just a quick, quick synopsis of, uh, of Bowen's defenses. Quick synopsis. So firstly, when Bowen took over the Tennessee Titans defense in 2021, the defense experienced a, 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 a massive increase in production from an EPA, a success rate, a DVOA, all the advanced analytics said that the defense took a massive jump. Now, what I find interesting is how much of that was due to Shane Bowen, Mike Vrabel, who is a head coach, or it's due to Jim Schwartz being a senior defensive analyst for 2021 and 2022. But if we're speaking just on the product, on the football field with the Tennessee Titans, Shane Bowen does not bring nearly as much pressure as, let's say, a Wink Martindale or even a lot of other coordinators. He's mainly relied on twists and things of that nature to get pressure. Now, he'll still throw in fire zone pressures and fire zone blitzes, which is five men coming disguised well with zone on the back end. The the defense as a whole, though, I would say from a run defensive standpoint, a run fitting standpoint, has been above average has been very successful through the three years when he was in Tennessee, took a little bit of a step back this season, but it did seem like it was much more personnel based. The defense as a whole, when the personnel was good, the defense was successful. When the personnel sucked a little bit, it wasn't as successful, but it is a little bit difficult to read between the lines on exactly what Shane Bowen is about. Who's like a 38 year old defensive coordinator who had a defensive head coach who had a really talented defensive analyst on staff, but I wouldn't expect nearly as much pressure because the Titans have been on the back end of pressure and have relied on four man rushes with high side edge rushes. So what I mean by that is a lot of the twists that they ran on third down, which they employed a lot of three, three, five and a lot of two, four, five. So it's a lot of nickel. It's an odd front, meaning it's a three, four when it is base. So Dexter Lawrence should be able to feast against those opposing centers. B gap should be closed, should create the five man front that we were used to seeing with Wink Martindale, but they use base personnel hardly last season. They're in nickel a lot. So those nickel twists that I was talking about, it's not necessarily an ET twist, which is when the end is going to penetrate and then the tackle is going to twist around. He usually used his twists from the interior. So both defensive tackles and defensive linemen were executing the twist. And then he would send those Ed Landry is a very explosive edge rusher wide around the tackle from a wide alignment to get that tackle really to open up and to hopefully allow one of those looping defensive linemen to come in through that B gap. This is different than what Wink Martindale did because it's only a four man rush. So all of those other assets are allocated towards being in coverage. So what you're looking for, for those edge rushers, Ed, is explosiveness. And the Giants do have explosive edge rushers when Aziz Ojolari is healthy and in Kayvon Thibodeau, who I would say took a little bit step forward with his explosiveness in his second season. So I'm expecting them to be able to pin their ears back from wide angles and rush and then have Dexter Lawrence and whatever other defensive tackle to execute on those twists if they employ a similar pressure type of framework that he used in 2020 to 2023. Right. You know, in the post that I did at Big Blue View, you know, I, I mentioned the the pressure rates and obviously, you know, Wink Martindale always near the top in pressure rate. In fact, in 2022, Giants blitzed more than anyone else. Bowen's defenses in his three years 
bottom 10 in pressure rate. I think that for, you know, for the person who doesn't understand the nitty gritty of every defensive scheme, I think probably the Shane Bowen defense is going to remind more of Patrick Graham than it did of than it than it does of, of Wink Martindale. More of the the bend but don't break. You know, more of the you know use coverage, use zones. Try to try to uh, try to confuse the quarterback that way. I think that's fair. Now there's a lot of variation between Patrick Graham and and Shane Bowen, right? Like there's they're not the same exact type of coordinators. But Shane Bowen's defense with the Titans, it was a little bit more zone coverage than man coverage. That's more like Patrick Graham. This is going to be a different type of defense than Wink Martindale. Wink Martindale ran a very unique defense that I would say threw fits on opposing protection packages. You're going to see disguises from Shane Bowen's defense, but it's not as exotic as Wink Martindale's. It's a little bit more of a simpler defense if you want to uh, if you want to kind of label it in that type of manner. But the interesting thing that you mentioned is, you know, with Jim Schwartz there in Tennessee for a while and Mike Vrabel as the head coach, Shane Bowen will be more on his own here in New York than than he was. And But he may also be, you know, three years as a coordinator, having learned some things from Vrabel, having learned some things from Schwartz. It may be a, it may be time. This may be a good step for Shane Bowen. I think you're right. I think it's absolutely a good step for for Shane Bowen now, there are a lot of a lot of people, a lot of a lot of things on Twitter recently suggesting that the Giants defense, some of the other defensive coordinator candidates might have opted not to take this job because this could be a one and done situation. I'm hoping that is not the case for Shane Bowen. I'm hoping that is not the case the case for the New York Giants. But Shane Bowen, there's some personnel here on the defense that need some retooling if we're going to be fair, right? I think right. he has some solid building blocks. So, I mean, Dexter Lawrence, look, they had Jeffrey Simmons. Jeffrey Simmons had some very good football seasons for the Tennessee Titans. Dexter Lawrence is a bit of a different player than Jeffrey Simmons, but he is just as effective as an interior pass rusher. And I think Dexter Lawrence can thrive in any system. And now when you're in base, you could still have him as that just person who you put right at the nose and you can just have him control the center. And, uh, Kayvon Thibodeau, Aziz Ojolari, Deontay Banks, Bobby Okereke, all of these players, those are all building blocks. But you look around the defense, man, from a depth standpoint, especially in the secondary, depending on what happens with Xavier McKinney, we need to get Shane Bowen some assets to work with heading into the 2024 season. Right. You know, it's interesting. When when I talked to, uh, I talked to Teron Davenport, who covers the Titans for ESPN, I also talked to... Jimmy Morris of SB Nation's Music City Miracles, who covered the uh, the Titans. And the interesting thing that Morris said is, in reference to Bowen, he said, the Titans' defense performed almost exactly like it should have based on opponents and personnel available. He didn't deserve to be fired. He was just a Mike Vrabel guy, and there was no scenario in which he was going to stay You know, once Vrabel got fired. And, you know, Teron Davenport basically talked about what you talked about. Three, four, but some variation, not a lot of press, and, you know, but a lot of a lot of sub package kind of defense. We're going to see a lot of sub package, but not to the level that we saw with Wink Martindale, let's say, in 2022. Because remember in 2022, when the Giants actually made the playoffs, they didn't have Bobby Okereke. So their linebackers were huge liabilities. So the Giants did everything in their power not to have linebackers on the football field to the point where against Green Bay, it was like first and 10 in the red zone. And they're in their quarter package where it's seven defensive backs out there, which was wild. I don't think you're going to see that type of variation with Shane Bowen. You're going to see more just 3-3-5, and I think a lot of this is going to depend on what the Giants do. You're going to see three, three, five. You're going to see two, four, five, and then you're going to see dime. So two, three, six. You're going to see those types of personnel packages out there, depending on the on the situation. And um, I'm excited to see what exactly is going to happen. I don't know if you want to get into Ed. Just uh, this wasn't the Giants' first choice, right? Because I, I see a lot of. Well, no, it wasn't. It wasn't the Giants' first choice. I think that's apparent. I think, although. You know, you can look at it this way, too, because the Giants interviewed Shane Bowen after exactly. Mike Vrabel got fired. He was one of the first people that they interviewed. And then it turned out 
to be a case where the Titans allowed the interview, but then it was, we're going to keep him here on staff until we hire a head coach. And then they hired a head coach, and then they hired Denard Wilson, which made Bowen available. So I think it's absolutely true that Bowen was not the first choice here. I think, and I, and I wrote that today at Big Blue View, I think, in, and I don't have inside information on it, but I think the uh, the timeline and what Joe Sheen said last week about wanting to hire a coordinator by last Friday indicates really that they were waiting on Denard Wilson's decision. Yeah. And and I want to say something about Denard Wilson's decision, and I've I've said this in other places. Some people are killing Joe Shane because Denard Wilson didn't get hired. And there's not a soul on the planet who knows for certain that Denard Wilson's going to be a good defensive coordinator. But the fact of the matter is Denard Wilson had choices. He chose Tennessee. I've talked to a lot of people about why he might have chosen Tennessee over the Giants. And and it's pretty standard fare in the NFL for assistant coaches who don't have much security as it is because they're at the whim of, you know, what happens whenever the coach they're working for gets fired it's pretty standard fare for them to look for the opportunity that gives them the most possible stability. There can't help but be an impression with Brian Dable, not about the volatility and, and the, the, the Wink Martindale situation, although maybe that plays into it, but there can't help but be a, a perception that Brian Dable's on the hot seat entering 2024. And I think, that a coach with an opportunity, you know, with a brand new head coach like in Tennessee with Brian Callahan, that's a two or three year, that's pretty much a guaranteed two or three year runway. So I can't blame Denard Wilson for making that choice. And I, and, and I do think it's a factor. I think it's a factor in, in the entire defensive coordinator search. And under that framework, that substructure that you, you just laid out, Ed, is this one of the best case scenarios then getting a guy like Shane Bowen who has called plays before, who is outside of the organization. You didn't promote from within. You didn't promote Jerome Henderson from within. I still personally wanted to get someone from outside the organization with a different type of perspective. This is a young guy who has had success as a defensive coordinator. So from that framework that you laid out, if that is true, I'm wondering if this if this is maybe like the best case scenario with all of those other uh, coordinators with options opting to go in other directions for all the reasons you just said. Well, what I would say, Shane Bowen is still 37 years old. He would still be considered an up and coming, yes, you know, coordinator candidate, an up and coming, you know, NFL assistant coach. I would agree with you that I think under the circumstances. If we agree that they didn't get the candidate they wanted in Denard Wilson, and then I think it's pretty apparent that when the Giants interviewed Bobby Babbage, the Buffalo Bills went, oh, crap. Yep. You know, well, we want him to stay here. And the only way we, we can guarantee he stays here is if we, if we make him defensive coordinator. You know, if we make Sean McDermott the – the the CEO head coach and make Bobby Babbage CEO technically, but if we at least give Bobby Babbage the defensive coordinator title. So to me, that tells you that that those two guys, you know, that they were good candidates, that they were desirable candidates. But I do think this is with whatever's left. You know, I was going through today trying to find other candidates the Giants hadn't interviewed. And I'm like, there's not much out there. There's just not much out there at this point, you know, unless Lovey Smith wants to come back and coach again or or Jim Leonard, the former Wisconsin defensive coordinator, wants to come to the NFL, which I don't think he does. But there's not much out there. So for me, Brian Dable, Joe Shane entering a year three where there's pressure on them. There's no doubt because year two didn't go well. Year two was 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 a step back. This 
first month or so of the off season hasn't gone well. And I think that ramps up the pressure on them as well. They've got a guy in Bowen and, and I've never really studied Shane Bowen, but if you look at the resume, he's had some success in Tennessee. He's learned from really good defensive coaches and he's called plays and installed schemes before, which, which erases that question. It's something that we know he can do. It's something that we know is not too big for him. And, and, and I always thought considering where the giants are with the pressure that's going to be on Brian Dable, he needs that for the simple reason that he needs not to have to run down the hallway, you know, every day of the week and worry about whether his defensive coordinators got a good game plan installed, whether he's up to the task, you know, what's he doing? And he needs to be able to focus on, on what he does best, which is the offense and which is relationship building and and all of that. And, and so I thought it was, I always hoped that the giants would hire someone with some play calling experience. And this, and this coach too, Shane Bowen, he did have a defensive coach over the top of him and Mike Rabel, who I'm sure has been in his ear. Cause let's not sugarcoat this either. Brian Dable, he might micromanage a little bit. And that's what head coaches do. They have Did every he's... right. No, he doesn't. <laughs> they have every right to do that, right? Yes. The last defensive coordinator didn't really like that. Took a little bit of an exception to that, right? Absolutely. Shane Bowen's a little bit of a younger guy. Is used to having maybe uh, a head coach who assisted somewhat in the game plan. We're not really certain of that. So maybe when Dable does give his input, it won't be a resistance there that's going to lead to this fractured type of lock locker room that hopefully doesn't bifurcate. And then you get like the offense versus the defense, because that would be the worst type of situation. So hopefully we have a Shane Bowen, who was a younger coach with a little bit more receptive to listening to the head coach. That's not necessarily what happened last season. It definitely doesn't seem so. No, absolutely not. And, and you hit on an important point here. All right. Brian Dable played defensive back in college, Hmm. all right? He worked in the very, very beginning of his career collegiately. I think he worked as a defensive assistant. But Brian Dable has been an offensive head coach for 20-plus years now. Brian Dable is not a defensive expert. He's not a guy that, that, you know, breaks, you know, that, that can install defensive schemes. But the point that you hit on, and you and I have talked about this before, Brian Dable is the head coach. If Brian Dable wants to sit in a defensive meeting or a special teams meeting or an offensive line meeting or a cornerback meet, whatever, if he wants to sit in that meeting and offer a suggestion or say, you know, this week, looking at this opponent, you know, maybe from an offensive perspective or whatever, I, I'd rather not have us go blitz crazy this week. If he wants, you know, if he wants to sit in that meeting and offer a suggestion, he's the head coach. Yeah. He's he's got every right to do that. And and as you said, if if that didn't go over well with the previous defensive coordinator, then so be it. Because when you're not the boss, you know, all of us have bosses, and we don't always like what they tell us. <laughs> you know, we don't always, we don't always like what they tell us, but you know, but, but we have to deal with that and do our jobs the best we can, you know, within those, within whatever those constraints are. Absolutely. And one more thing too, on, on this hire, there's positional coaches already in place. A lot of times when you hire a coordinator on either side of the football, they expect that they can fill out their staff with the personnel that they want this is hiring a, a defensive coordinator where you have a linebacker coach, where you have a defensive line coach, where you have a secondary coach. Now you need a edge coach because the Wilkinses are not here anymore. But this is somebody with all of those attributes and all of those experiences that we already talked about coming in and then assuming this role and is going to going to 
a try and work with these coaches that I don't really think he's ever worked with before Shane Bowen. Cause if you look at Shane Bowen's past, it's really just been with Mike Vrabel. He was a student assistant in 2009 at Georgia tech. Then he left Georgia tech in 2011, became a grad assistant at Ohio state in 2012. Then he was at Kennesaw state as a linebackers coach from 2013 to 2015. And then he was with the Texans from 2016 to 2017 as a defensive assistant before he got to the Titans as the outside linebackers coach 2018 to 2020 before getting the defensive coordinator spot in 2021. So it's not like he has this really long resume. I don't know who he has networked with in the past, but he has a lot of positional coaches that I feel like are very good right now with the New York Giants. I think Andre Patterson, and Jerome Henderson are two of the better defensive positional coaches that we have had here in New York since I've covered this team and since before I've covered this team. And the Giants have had a lot of good ones over the years. So I'm I'm uh, I'm happy that they were able to find somebody with experience and everything that we already laid out and somebody who's willing to work with coaches that he might not know all that well. Yeah, there was a report, I think, from Jeremy Fowler that the Giants would be interviewing some of the assistant coaches that Bowen had worked with in Tennessee. Obviously, we know that the outside linebacker coach, you know, um, is a position that's open. I have my fingers crossed that Andre Patterson, who is a fantastic defensive coach and a fantastic human being, is, you know, he's had some health issues the last couple of years. I have my fingers crossed that he continues to do what he does and uh, the one that I wonder about, to be honest with you, is I wonder about Jerome Henderson, who's very, very good at what he does. Yes. But Jerome Henderson was considered for this job and bypassed for this job. Maybe the only time in his career he gets that close to being a defensive coordinator. I do wonder if Jerome Henderson stays put, but, you know, crossing you know crossing my fingers and hoping that he does because he is very good at what he does then you're right there aren't a lot of uh, there aren't a lot of openings on this staff unless you know we've seen it before if if you want to bring a coach in and there isn't an obvious opening for him we see it all the time teams create titles and openings and positions to bring guys in the the edge coach or the outside linebackers coach, I should say for the Titans was just fired about a week ago. His name is Ryan Crow. He was on staff with the Titans since 2021 when Shane Bowen took over as the defensive coordinator. So that's definitely a name to monitor. And I think he coached at Ohio state as a defensive assistant for a few seasons before that. He's a young guy as well. So Ryan Crow for anybody who wants to look at who might be the giants or might have a chance to be the giants outside linebacker coach, just off of familiarity. Yeah. I, I had, uh, I had kind of landed on that name as well. When I looked at the coaches that, uh, that Shane Bowen had, had worked with, you know, I want to throw something out here for you. That's really not necessarily Shane Bowen related, gotcha. but Kayvon Thibodeau. Mm-hmm. All right. Went from four sacks as a rookie to 11 and a half sacks, whatever it was in his second year. But when you look at the, the efficiency numbers, the pressure rates, all of that, his numbers really aren't that good. His pressure rate is near the bottom of the league for edge rushers. It's I, I think it's like 45th out of 55 you know, qualifying edge rushers. Something that that I have wanted to see for two years, and we talked about Andre Patterson, and something that I know never happened because I've asked Coach Patterson about this. Kayvon Thibodeau has never sat in Andre Patterson's room and learned pass rush or learned technique from Andre Patterson, who had a huge impact on Daniil Hunter had a huge impact on Linville Joseph, had a huge impact on Dexter Lawrence, huge impact on a lot of defensive linemen and defensive ends throughout his career. I know that Kayvon Thibodeau has never worked with Andre Patterson. I don't know if that's Wink Martindale and the Wilkins brothers saying he belongs to the Wilkins brothers. You know, Drew Wilkins was, was Wink Martindale's right-hand man, but provided Andre Patterson stays, 
I would love to see Kayvon Thibodeau spend some time working pass rush with Andre Patterson. I just, I just love the idea of Patterson getting his hands on Thibodeau. As do I, because I think one of the aspects of Thibodeau's game that still has just a long way to go is his ability to to counter once his first move is stopped. His ability to get to a secondary pass rushing move. I think he anticipates what the offensive line is going to do to a solid rate, but I don't know if his his placement and his striking ability is as effective as it could be if he gets with somebody like an Andre Patterson, because we saw what Andre Patterson was able to get out of Dexter Lawrence, who oozed potential, put him at the nose. And then it's not just Dexter Lawrence moving to the nose that that took his game to another level, that took it to superstardom. It's how efficient he is with his hands. Every movement from Dexter Lawrence's hands is effective. You rarely see him stopped. And not, yes, he's powerful and he's big and he's agile, but he knows where to strike and when to strike and how to manipulate the leverage of opposing offensive linemen. That's not something that Kayvon has. I think Kayvon did a really good job this season progressing his game to, to be a little bit more successful as a high side rusher. We saw that really manifest itself against the New York Jets, but there's still a lot. A lot of ways to go for somebody who was what the number one overall or the number two overall recruit in his recruiting class. Like you're talking about a top notch prospect in cave on Thibodeau. And I, I, I think you're onto something there. If he can get with Andre Patterson, maybe we can see him take that third year jump that we're all hoping he does. Absolutely. And you know, we'd kind of be remiss if we didn't wrap up by just talking about the fact that, that, the offseason to this point's been kind of a mess for the Giants. You know, the whole the whole Dable Martindale divorce and how all of that came down and and all the 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 talk about nobody wants to work with Brian Dable and 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 yeah, it's a lot of guys. Eight or eight potential, you know, eight coaches that have already been changed for the Giants coaching staff. Would have been nine if they had allowed Mike Kafka to interview in Seattle. Because I'm pretty sure Mike Kafka would have jumped at the opportunity to run that offense with the Seahawks <laughs> and and do it on his own. I'm pretty sure that would have happened. But you know how you know how you fix all of this, Nick. You know how you fix all of this. You win. All all of this goes away if the Giants win. All of it goes away if they win in 2024. If they don't win, if they don't win, it all goes it all goes into John Mara's little little notebook and his little file that's his little columns of keep day bowl versus can day bowl. All this stuff goes into that little checklist, but if they win, then all of this gnashing of teeth goes away. Yes. And one more thing I want to bring up to Ed, there's a lot of, there's a considerable amount of defensive free agents from the Tennessee Titans that might hit free agency that giants and Shane Bowen, depending on their cap situation, might be interested in bringing in to fit the system for familiarity reasons and also because they're solid football players and the Giants need a lot of depth. So that's something that we'll be covering at Big Blue View. I'm sure I'll be writing a lot about players like Aziz Alshire and, and Sean Murphy Bunting and Terrell Edmonds and players like that. Absolutely. We'll be, you know, we're still, I'm still kind of working my way through the uh, the Giants list of, of unrestricted free agencies and um, free agents and Interestingly, I kind of just got to Isaiah Simmons and and uh, one of the things that I wrote before knowing about the, the Shane Bowen hire was whether or not you even want to keep a guy like Isaiah Simmons depends on whether the defensive coordinator has a plan for how to use this guy because they certainly didn't know how to use him in Arizona. And Wink Martindale seemed to have a pretty good plan for for how to get something out of Isaiah Simmons. And that is something Joe Shane went to Wink Martindale before they made the trade and said, do you like this guy? How would you use him? You know, can we make it work with this guy? I don't know if it works with Shane Bowen. We'll have to see. But uh, but that's that's an interesting one. Xavier McKinney is an interesting one because to me, Xavier McKinney flourished under Patrick Graham. He was really good also the second half of, of this past season, but I've always looked at Xavier McKinney as a better player facing the quarterback than playing man to man, than you know, than, than going down in the slot and, and trying to chase a receiver. 
but I'm interested in whether Xavier McKinney wants to come back and whether or not the Giants want him back and want to meet his price tag because he's not going to come back for cheap. No, he's not going to come back for cheap. I think he could work in the system. I think, she, honestly, I'm a big Xavier McKinney fan. I, I like his skill set, and I think he can do anything you really ask him to do from the safety position. This is a defense right here. They spent a decent amount of time in the middle of the field closed and a decent amount of time in the middle of the field open. So he, he can handle both of those assignments. I think if you want him to play center field in a middle of the field closed type of defense, he can execute that for you. But if you want him to rotate down, if you think he is good at undercutting slant routes and dig routes and crossing routes, he can do that. I believe he can man up. I think we saw that in Wink Martindale's defense. And uh, the height of that was against TJ Hawkinson in the, in the playoff win last season. I'm interested, though, because it's all going to come down to money, and I don't know what the market is for these safeties. It's really weird. I thought Julian Love would get paid a lot more than $6 mil a year. He didn't. He ended up getting just that, I think, maybe slightly more than that. I think it was last six. Season. I think it was two years, $12 Over million. 12. Yeah, and I thought it would be more than that, and I think the Seattle Seahawks are looking at that contract saying this dude is worth every single penny. But Xavier McKinney is a little bit different than Julian Love, and I, I expect him to command more than $6 mil a year. I think it might even be double that. Yeah, I think so. I think I looked at – I looked at it the other day. The top 10 safeties make from 19 million annually down to 13. Hmm. I fully expect Xavier McKinney to want to crack that top 10. I think so too. I, I, <laughs> I don't, and I don't know that the Giants will go there. But so. but uh but you know it's it's a different situation for me with Xavier McKinney than it was with Julian Love. Julian Love. We know now that the Giants had a replacement sitting there and they knew they had a replacement sitting there in Jason Pinnock, who did a really good job. I don't know that you easily replace a Xavier McKinney, who, as you said, can, can do everything you want a safety to do and played every single snap last year. You don't have a replacement for that. No. No, you don't. And Mark Thompson in the chat, too, Ed, before we get out of here, asked a question. Do you think Simmons could play safety? Would that be a consideration? I think you can rotate Simmons like Wink Martindale did from the line of scrimmage to a middle of the field closed type of look for uh, disguising purposes. But full time safety? No, because that requires a lot of just understanding angles and anticipation when you're filling the run. And those are aspects of Isaiah Simmons game that I'm a little hesitant to say, yeah, plug him in to be a full time safety. You did not see him out there on first and second down often, unless it was second and seven plus in Wink Martindale's defense. He was a third down pass rusher, blitzing type of specialist who could drop off the line of scrimmage for those disguising purposes I was referencing before in Wink Martindale's defense. So I don't, I wouldn't trust him in a full time role from that. Can you try it out in training camp and in pre? Sure, but that's not exactly where I'm at. And I think Isaiah Simmons is a Swiss Army knife for the right defensive coordinator. I think if the Giants played with leads this year, Wink Martindale would have been that defensive coordinator. But the Giants were trailing so much in the second half because their offense sucked so bad that Isaiah Simmons really never had the opportunity to pin his ears back on third and long situations to get at their opposing quarterback. So if I'm Isaiah Simmons, I'm going to a team like the Chiefs. I'm going to a team that has a lot of leads where I can showcase my talent and cash in on a one-year contract. That's what I'm doing if I'm Isaiah Simmons. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where I go if I'm Isaiah Simmons, but when I look at Isaiah Simmons, I see an athlete. I see. I don't see an instinctive player. No. I don't necessarily see a guy who, who can read and react. He just, you move him around. And you use him in ways where his athleticism will benefit you because it's it's not his it's not his his instincts that that make him you know the the kind of player that he is. Anyway, Nick, we uh, I think we uh, I think we've pretty much hit most of the topics. Giants fans, there's one less thing for you guys to worry about now. Now you can just worry about Saquon and quarterback and the draft and free agency and, and whether Brian Dable gets a fourth year and all that fun stuff. But there's one fewer thing for you to worry about. So so uh, thank goodness for that. Thank goodness. <laughs> yes. Nick, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much for, for hopping on. Giants fans, thank you as always for listening to uh, to whatever we're calling today's shows the 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 Ed and Nick show or whatever we're calling today. 
but uh as i said nick appreciate your your taking a few minutes so uh, giants fans please uh remember to check out my show check out the uh, the chris and nick show or nick and chris show or whichever way you guys do that <laughs> i i don't remember offhand but uh thank you as always for for listening stay safe out there take care of each other and we'll talk to you soon bye bye